Hi, welcome back to Ask a Creationist. I'm Todd Wood. I'm president of Core Academy of Science. I'm here to answer your questions about creation or evolution, origin, science, faith, whatever you got. We're interested in knowing what you're wondering about. And maybe we'll consider uh, putting your question on a future episode of Ask a Creationist. This week's question comes from, let's say, the general world of uh, internet argumentation, and it is very simple. Is there evidence against evolution? And I include this not because anyone's really asked me directly, but because I'm on record as saying that there is evidence for evolution. There is a reasonable case to be made for it. Somehow that gets turned into there is only evidence for evolution, or all the evidence supports evolution, or there's no open questions. There are no anomalies. There are no you know, problem areas that everything is good for evolution and there's absolutely no evidence for creation, which is quite different from my actual position. And having, well, let's just say, had it up to here with reading that nonsense on the internet, I decided it's about time to set the record straight. So here we go. This is actually gonna take a number of episodes here because I got a lot to say. But first, I have to sort of reframe this because the question itself is a little awkward. And I would like to sort of rephrase the question. Is there evidence that is inconsistent with or poorly explained by evolution? And I do that, you know, I'm phrasing it in this way because the idea of evidence for and against, it, it carries such weight. People th seem to think that evidence for something means it must be true and evidence against something must mean that it's false, which is not at all how normal human beings reason but for some reason, when we get into this arena, it gets all weird. And I guess maybe it's because people think this is some sort of TV trial and the way it works on TV is how it works in real life and it's a courtroom drama and newsflash, that's not how it works. It's not a TV trial. No one's gonna run in at the last minute with evidence to exonerate the client or condemn the client or anything like that. Once in a blue moon, those sorts of things come along and they are widely celebrated when they do, but generally speaking, we don't get these kind of monumental earth-moving events in it's the way we do science. So when we talk about evidence, what do we mean? Well, evidence is basically a piece of data that is consistent with a model. Now, you might be thinking, you know, sometimes data that is collected is actually collected in the context of a model. And in fact, the data wouldn't even exist if there wasn't a model. And that is often quite right. Uh, so, you know, we're gonna have to sort of agree to understand like Darwin did with the idea of species. No one can define it, but we all generally have an idea of what we're talking about and what we talk about. Data might be measurements, data might be observations, qualitative observations, that sort of thing. Then a model is a kind of a story or an explanation, kind of attempts to account for a large amount of data. A model is not like a theory, it's not like a hypothesis. Models are these large structures, and generally models are really big structures that are attempting to describe a reality. This is how models actually work. This is how scientists begin to think about how, how do we put all these pieces together and create a model that explains the data. Another thing about models is they're all underdetermined. And that means that they are all extrapolating beyond the observations that we have. We have a very limited number of observations and models extrapolate widely from those limited number of observations. We also find, speaking historically, looking at sort of the long view of the history of science, is that most models are transient. Uh, they come and they go. Some of them, bulk of the model might be kept in the next iteration or sometimes the model might be thrown out altogether for a completely new model. And this has been the way it's been since people have begun making observations and studying things. Every time we make a new observation, it's either gonna be consistent with the model that we already have or it's gonna require some modifications. Uh, because as I say, models are underdetermined, right? There's more model than there is data. And eventually problems can build up in the model such that the model is not consistent with the data until it ends up being either heavily modified or just abandoned altogether. Now in biology, models aren't necessarily right or wrong. 
even though we sort of use that language, they're usually just, these models that we use are usually too complex and too adjustable for that sort of talk. It's more realistic to describe models as better or worse. There, some models are better at explaining the data than other models. Now, again, as I say, it doesn't, it doesn't really prevent us from saying that a certain model is wrong, especially if some of that comes from our own intuition, because we can see my model that I prefer explains more data than this model that the other guy prefers, his model must be wrong. That's a, that's a conclusion. We're, we're making a sort of a jump there, a leap from what we can actually observe about the consistency of our models. And sometimes there are some really big problems that cause you to conclude this model must be wrong because it keeps doing something wrong. And that drives you to come up with a better model. All right, so scientific models then. Uh, good models explain more data than poor models. And that's just the basis of model building, model construction, model selection. A model that explains 10 pieces of data is better than a model that explains only nine or eight. And yes, it is usually that simple in terms of sort of sorting things out and reasoning through stuff. Good models are often consilient. Consilient means that they can explain an array of data, usually very disparate and different kinds of data, with a single explanation. One of the things that made Newton's gravity so attractive and so compelling to people when they first learned of it and read about it was his explanation for the tides. No one really expected the motion of the moon and the sun and the planets and the stars would ever explain why we have tides. And yet Newton's gravity did just that. The gravity of the moon pulls on the water in the oceans and that makes the tides. So this was an example of consilience. Now, good biological models need not be simple, but they can be beautiful. Mostly I'm referring here to physics, Physicists love simple models. They love to tell you that all the universe can be described in a small set of equations. They'll write them down on a whiteboard. It's very exciting to them because, you know, there's this simplicity. And there's beauty in that simplicity as well. Once you have a really good model that explains things, there can be quite a lot of beauty in those models. Biology is a world of enormous complexity. And it's not deterministic like physics, and so things aren't necessarily simple. In fact, they're rarely simple. They're usually more complicated than you might expect them to be. But they often can be quite beautiful. Now, the big thing about scientific models is that all models have anomalous data. Let me say that again. All models have anomalous data. Anomalous data are data that do not fit the model. It's that simple. There are always going to be observations and pieces of data that don't fit a model. Because we're human beings, we are limited in our imagination of coming up with the model. There are limitations to what we can observe and measure. Models are underdetermined, right? So there's more data out there that we're speculating about, that we're predicting that we have not observed directly. And so there is always going to be little bits and pieces that don't fit the model. Now, let me give you an example from my own life history here, my field of biochemistry. When I was a graduate student, I studied structural biology for a time. And uh, in structural biology, we did something called X-ray crystallography. And in X-ray crystallography, you take a purified protein or some other macromolecule, macromolecule being a really big molecule, and you try to make crystals out of it. You shoot X-rays through it, which causes the x-rays to diffract, you collect data on the diffraction pattern, and those diffractions are done in very, very regular ways. You can see on the left here, that is a diffraction pattern of a bacterial transcription factor. And you can see the dots there represent places where the x-rays have diffracted, and you can see there's a regularity to it, right? It's quite beautiful. Uh, and so then you take all that diffraction data and you process it through a lot of complicated mathematics, and you get what we call an electron density map, which then is fitted with a molecular model. The molecular model being derived from the basic chemistry of how proteins fold. And so the thing on the right here is, is a molecular model that is derived from a different protein this time. This is what's called F1, F0 ATP synthase. And it's pretty cool, but... It is an electron density map to which we have fit a model. And there are various ways that we can measure the quality 
of the model, the molecular model on the right, as compared to the diffraction pattern on the left. And I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but the point is, the more complex the model, the more fuzzy it gets, the more underdetermined, the more open to interpretation it becomes. And that's just how it works. It is a necessity of the way we do biochemistry and structural biology. Now, that does not mean that the structure on the right is wrong or that somehow there are, you know, there's some horrible mistake in biochemistry textbooks. It just means that this is our best model for this protein given the circumstances under which it was collected. But parts of it could be wrong. And that's okay. We know that because, you know, we're biochemists and we're responsible dealing with the data that we collect. But the key here, again, I can't emphasize this enough. All models have anomalous data. No model gets away from anomalous data. Evolution has anomalous data. So does creation. We all do. So, you know, part of me is sort of reticent to point the finger at evolution because I'm going to point, have to point the finger back at myself. I have anomalies that don't fit yet. And there's nothing particularly egregiously awful about anomalous data. It just is what it is. So to me, the more interesting question is, you know, when is it that the anomalies become big enough that scientists begin to look for some other model? And what are the circumstances that lead to that? And the history of science can tell us a lot about these sorts of things. And this is sort of what might be called the paradigm shift, right? So in the Cunian world and, and his notion of the scientific paradigm, he would understand there to be a major, a point at which anomalies become so big that, boom, the, the model changes and you get a new model. And so I think studying those kinds of things in history can give us clues as to how we ought to proceed. We creationists ought to proceed in thinking about evolution and its anomalies. If you want to make a really good case for creation, I think we ought to pay attention to these sorts of things. So then that brings me back to the original question, which I'm going to reformulate one more time. What are evolution's anomalies? And I hate to leave you hanging, but I'm well over time, so we're going to talk about that in the next episode. Thanks for watching. Hey, if you've enjoyed this video, check us out at Corsi.org. There you'll find links to our social media accounts. We're on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can sign up for our electronic newsletter. You can also click on the donate link. We would very much appreciate your support. This has been a difficult year, as you might imagine. Um, and we are very grateful for all of our friends and supporters out there who have uh, given to make this ministry possible. Also, while you're at it, leave a like on this video. Even if you didn't like it, leave a dislike. There's some dude who's been disliking all of my videos lately, so thanks for that. God bless you. Uh, continue interacting with our videos. That just improves our stats on YouTube's um, stat chart. I don't know how that works. But anyway, it does. Interact with us. It's good. Click subscribe. Click the bell to get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.